and it's a great honor to introduce Edmund Duval, who I feel needs no introduction from me. Um, he's often described himself modestly as a potter who writes, and I think we can now regard him as a globally recognized artist whose work, whether text or object, concerns memory and its fragility and contingency. Um, he began his career after leaving Cambridge, where he read English, as a studio potter making functional wares, first in stoneware and then in porcelain. While still a schoolboy and before going up to Cambridge, he worked alongside the potter Geoffrey Whiting in an apprentice role. So he really understands the ceramic workshop uh, as a site of creativity. But over time, um, Edmund of Arles began to present his work in multiple installations with a powerful narrative charge, invariably sensitive to place and space, beginning bringing particular histories of loss and exile into renewed life. Both his artistic and written practice have broken new ground through their critical engagement with the history and potential of ceramics, um, engaging them with parallel histories of architecture, music, dance, and poetry. Edmund continually investigates themes of diaspora, memory, and materiality with his interventions and artworks made for diverse spaces and museums worldwide. Out of an enormously busy exhibition program, I'd like especially to mention Edmund's two-part project, Psalm, <coughs> shown at the Venice Biennale. In particular, one part of this, shown at the Ateneo building, held one of his most ambitious works to date, the now much-traveled Library of Exile, um, which was a pavilion of his own work and 2,000 books written by those forced to leave their own country or exiled within it. And this Library of Exile was uh, probably seen by many of you at the British Library um, and has now, I think, gone on to Iraq, its final home. Edmund's written the best, to my mind, short history of 20th century ceramics as part of the Thames and Hudson World of Art. Thank you. Theory. <laughs> and a short study of the potter Bernard Leach, who is in a sense our host today, uh, that made all of us reassess Bernard Leach, think about him afresh, both positively and negatively. Meanwhile, Edmund de Waal's book, The Hair with Amber Eyes, the most remarkable book, a biography of part of his family and a story of loss and diaspora of both people and things is rightly uh, an international bestseller. His latest book, Letters to Komodo, continue his investigation into loss and memory, cast as a series of letters to the great Parisian collector. Um, it's already published in five languages. And I think Edmund's writings and his artwork have never seemed more relevant to our attempts to make sense of the present. Uh, a pretty grim present, it must be said, uh, with war in Ukraine, a time of extraordinary anxiety and uncertainty in Europe, uh, and several other multiple recent forced exiles. Um, from Syria, from Afghanistan, just to name two places. So on this rather gloomy but hopeful note, um, it's a great pleasure to welcome Edmund Duval. Thank you so much, Tanya. It's, 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 a, it's such a pleasure. Thank you for you, that generous and, and intimidating introduction. Um, um, but I'm 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 so pleased to be to be to be with you. I'm so pleased to be part of this extraordinary conversation and 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 to, to have heard that remarkable presentation just before us. Um, what a great exhibition it was, how thrilling it is to know it's going to York so we can see it all again um, in a great catalogue. Um, uh, um, I'm going to race um, through things that matter to me and places that matter to me, um, trying to talk about, about the positioning of, well, the contingency, I suppose, of, of, of how we can think about, about, um, about ceramics and where they can sit in the world and, and, and ceramics and social action, um, taking us back to, I think, the, the wonderful positioning of this, 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 uh, of this, this day, which is um, 
um, the, the contrarian nature of Leach's project, um, you know, the, 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 the radical nature of that. And, and I, we may get back to that in questions, but I'm start, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be saying next, next, next. Um, I start in West Nord, this, I'm in my studio here in South London. I start with music and wet clay, next please. This is my wheel, next. This is my dog, uh, next. This is where I work, next. Um, and this is what I do, and I've been doing it uh, since I was a child, uh, properly since uh, since five, uh, properly since 12, apprenticed at 16 and on. Um, and what I do is bring things together, next please, in the studio and next. Uh, and then I find places in the world. So the first stopping point is Vienna, um, an invitation next from the Kunsthistorische Museum, the, the, the great museum in, in Vienna on the Ringstrasse, which was the great um, 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 uh, motor behind uh, the looting and diaspora of, 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 uh, of uh, Vienna's Jews in 1938. This is my father's family. He grew up just beyond this little uh, temple on, on, on the Ringstrasse in his own house. Uh, I had an invitation after my book, The Hair with Amber Eyes, came out saying, would I do something in Vienna, in this particular pavilion? What do you do? If you're thinking about restitution, what do you do about bringing something back to a city that has dispossessed you uh, and, 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 and 75,000 other families uh, from the city? What I chose to do, if we have the next slide, was to make this pair of vitrines. It's a pair of, of glazed, vitrines which hold, if we have the next three slides, um, uh, 264 uh, small white porcelain vessels, each of them um, made just up here behind me, and each of these um, has, has, um, has a sense of, of um, immediacy, um, of not really thinking, uh, of, of being in the moment, but brought together uh, white and cream vessels, if I have the next slide, um, what they do is to have a poem. They make a poem, and the poem is a poem by the great um, uh, poet, Jewish poet, uh, born in Chernovitz, now in Ukraine, uh, Paul Celan. Uh, Celan, um, the poet of the great 20th century poet of the German language, who, whose family uh, were dispossessed and, and murdered in the Shoah. Uh, um, and his language is, is fractured. And so I make a poem out of these objects and bring it to Vienna. It's called Lichtzwang, a light duress, powerful words brought together. And, 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 and this poem is then held with it written in German and English in Vienna for six months. This, this, this pavilion that people walk into and walk out of. And what that is, is placing or replacing objects into a place uh, and trying to work out what might happen, trying to find the agency of where you put objects, in this case, small inconsequential um, objects. And of course, for me, there's a, there's a, there's a resonance because I, I put the same number of objects into these two uh, white vitrines um, as the number of, 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 of Japanese netsuke that, that I, I inherited from my great dear great uncle and, and, and tell the story of in my book. So this is a beginning, but, but, but I'm going to tell you just a little bit about Paris. So you have the next slide. This is where I am now, um, um, just for one more week. Uh, the next slide, please. On the Rue de Monceau, uh, next slide. And this is, and the next, this is uh, the Musée Nissim de Camondo. Um, this is 10 doors down away from where my, my, my Parisian um, uh, family, the Afrissi family, uh, uh, moved in 1868, the same time as the Camondo family uh, came from Istanbul. And they built this extraordinary house just down the road. Th their cousins, this is my grandmother's cousin's house. She remembers this house from the 19 remembered. This house from living in Paris in the 1920s when she was a journalist and a poet. You go into this house and it's like this, the next one, it, slide please, and it's full of marble and grandeur. But if you go up, next slide, um, uh, the, 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 the staircase on your right into the servants' quarters at the top, what do you find? You go up into, next slide please, and the next. You find room and the next, 
and room after archives. You find archives in paper. So I've been haunted by this house. This is a house, um, a, a family house, a Jewish house. It was put together by this man. The next slide, please. Moise de Camondo, here he is. He's a great collector. He marries, uh, the next slide, Irene Grandanvert. Here she is, this young girl, painted by Renoir, um, a, a great commission um, organized by my cousin, Charles Fussi. Uh, and when his parents die, he builds this extraordinary house. The next slide, with with, with these uh, beautiful rooms of, of boiserie, um, uh, and the next slide, and the next slide, full of incredible French art. He puts this together for his son. Next slide, please. His son Nissim de Camondo, a boy who, like all good Frenchmen, joins up as soon as he can in the first war. This is a family who are assimilated, have become Parisian. There's no uh, Turkishness here. They've become Parisian. Moise and his son and his daughter have become more Parisian than Parisian. And this beautiful house they put together is an example of that, an exemplar of how you become Parisian. But Nissim dies. He's killed in the first war, flying an aeroplane. And at that moment, this great house, which was to be passed on down the generations, becomes a memorial, a, 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 a mausoleum. Next slide, please. And his bedroom is untouched. Here it is in, in the house. And Moise does an extraordinary thing. He decides he's going to create this amazing house and he's going to pass it on to France in gratitude uh, for um, their generosity in. In, in, in allowing this Jewish family to become French. It's going to become a memorial for his son. And during the 20s and early 30s, that's what it does. He collects and collects and collects. And his daughter, Beatrice, here she is. The next slide, please. Um, and a beautiful photograph. Marries another of my mother, grandmother's cousins, great scholar and musician. And the will, he writes a will, he says, I'm going to pass this on, but nothing must be changed. And in 1935, when he dies, this next beautiful slide, almost a, a slide, uh, almost an image from Ashe, a great photographer. Um, this is the will. And there's a great moment in 1936, we have the next slide, when it becomes a museum, a museum in memory of Nissim, this, this lost boy this, who's murdered. And then what happens? 1940, uh, the Nazis walk in unopposed into Paris, as you know, and the beginning, attritional, a beginning of the story of what happens um, to French Jews. Uh, the looting, the next slide, please, and the next. And then the roundups, and in this archive, this archive I've spent so much time with amongst all these beautiful papers which list the, uh, the, the menus, the, the, the objects that were created, the letters from Proust, from, from uh, the letters to curators are these four pieces of paper. This next one, please. Beatrice de Camondo, the moment that she is arrested. If you see there, the 6th of December, 1942, Anna, Anna n'est pas libérée, do not liberate. She is completely Jewish. And the next slide, Fanny, their daughter who loved horses, arrested at the same moment, uh, taken um, to the concentration camp on the edge of Paris, guarded as we remember by French policemen. And the next one, uh, Léon Rayonac, uh, the, the husband, the musician, the composer, and their son, finally, this one, uh, Bertrand, the next slide, please. And they're taken from that camp and they are separately deported to Auschwitz where they are murdered in 1944 and 1945. And this is the last photograph, if we have the next slide, of Bertrand. Uh, this young boy, he was 19, who was training to be a craftsman. He was training to learn how to put marquetry 
an inlay into French furniture. He'd grown up in his grandfather's house amongst all that French furniture. And he is murdered in 1944 in Auschwitz. And the next slide. And the house doesn't change. The house is still a memorial. And after the war, when it's reopened, they put a small plaque as you come in from the Rue de Monceau saying, this is also now the place where these four last members of the family lived. And I had an invitation from the museum, which was to make an installation for this house. Moise's will says nothing new must come in and nothing must be moved. But they say to me, um, just for these few months, because they are cousins, you can do something. And so I have this imperative to make a memorial for this house. I write these letters to Moise de Camondo during lockdown, these, these trying to understand myself, my father, my, my family. And then in, in, in October last year, I, I bring to this house. And what I do, if we can have the next slide, is to make small installations using wood and lead uh, and porcelain. And the next slide, into some of the spaces of the house. And the next slide, and they sit there, not moving anything not moving anything, but I bring things in. And so the next slide, here is this amazing Sèvres desk, one of the great masterpieces of French porcelain. And I open the drawers and into these drawers, I make small porcelain boxes or weightless boxes. And I put porcelain shards and then I half close them again. And the next slide and on one of his desks, and the next slide, I put these stacks of porcelain tiles. I'm writing to him. I'm placing back into the house places where Moise and the family wrote letters. Um, I'm talking back to them through text and porcelain. And the next slide um, here on Moise's desk is a stack of these porcelain letters. And the next slide um, here just modestly put, and then the next slide in Nisim's bedroom, just a place called I am Nisim, just a piece of lead, some porcelain um, and some gold. And then I use the archives, I use these strange places which haven't changed, which are untouched, which haven't been seen and visited. And so up, up high in those servants' quarters, I, I, I put things back in. I re-inhabit the house. Uh, the next slide in the butler's pantry, here is a single porcelain tile um, with the Camondo seal just leaning up. I open the next slide, I open up the silver drawers and I put these in like re-archiving repositioning things back into these cupboards. And then in Moise's dressing room, high up uh, Valet's room where he, all the clothes were, I opened the cupboards and you can imagine the next slide finding this. And there's a Louis Vuitton trunk from 1930s. And I just put my vessels up there um, and equal music. Um, um, and I close the cupboards again. And these are pieces that have been barely seen in the last six months. Um, but they're there, but they're there. And some perhaps at the end of the show next Sunday will stay there just in the cupboards, just adding to the dust, the accretion of memory. And then outside in the courtyard, just the last four slides, you will know this amazing thing in Germany, the Stolpersteiner, the, the, the place where you put into, into the, um, the, 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 the pavement underneath the house where a family has been deported. You put a memorial just with the name. And Paris is a city where the, the presence of the shower is not existent. People don't understand it. And so I make benches, stone benches, 
um, uh, places to sit. And if you look at these, you'll see on the very edge, shall stop here for a moment, pause here. These are places to sit and congregate and just pause as before you go into the house, you'll see a piece of lead and gold, a kind of kintsugi, um, a kind of, of, of um, understanding of fracture and, and, and rupture just on these benches. And they sit there for these six months, seven months, eight months of the show. And it's been hugely moving to see people sitting there, uh, children climbing all over them, thank God. Um, this, is, this is how you should interact with a place. And that's Paris. And if you can get there before, before Sunday, I, I'm there, uh, Saturday night, late into the night. The, uh, the museum is open till 11 and um, I I'm, I'm, have this extraordinary feeling of being able to um, close the door. All these things will be removed uh, and Moise's house will, will stay as it was, but there will have been this conversation, this talking aloud about the lost family, this, 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 this presence of bringing back objects um, into the places where the family lived. And now we move, we move rapidly to the ghetto in, in, in Venice. Uh, and the next slide, please, uh, to the ghetto and the next slide, this extraordinary place um, on the edge or, or, or Venice, where there are, the next slide, please, um, these extraordinary synagogues, the next one, where there was an invitation from the, the, the Jewish community there to, to make an intervention, to make, to make a presence, the first time any artist had, had worked within the ghetto. And, 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 and again, how do I work here in this particular place, Biennale three years ago, as, as Tanya said. And so very modestly, what I've done, quietly, not modestly, I'm immodest, but I care, passionately about how present or uh, visible you are. Up on the way to the synagogue, if we have the next slide, a small piece called Adonai, and then on the next staircase up, a piece um, of Rilke's poetry. And then the next three slides, please, as you can see from the Canton Scuola, if we can run the next three or four slides, a piece called Tehillim, um, the Hebrew for Psalm, um, just pieces of, of porcelain and marble. Um, um, this is uh, the ghetto where uh, Jews were not allowed to use marble. Venice is full of marble, but the Jews aren't. So I bring marble back into the ghetto. And then high up, a place, uh, the Sukkah, where you celebrate Sukkot, the great fest harvest festival, the great marvelous festival. This temporary, if we have the next three slides, uh, this particular piece here, um, uh, and the next one, um, uh, the fragility of all these buildings, vessels, porcelain and gold. And then the other side, in the Ateneo Veneto, this extraordinary place, uh, the other side of Venice, if we can have the next three slides, this piece, um, Psalm, um, a work which practically uh, destroyed me uh, creatively. A, a, a piece, if we have the next three or four slides, it's a temporary pavilion, it's a space. Um, which is a library of exile. Uh, and when you look at this, if we stop there for a minute, this is wooden pavilion, but I have washed liquid kaolin, porcelain slip, um, all over it. It's a porcelain pavilion. And then into that, like a palimpsest, I have written um, um, a history of the lost and destroyed library, book burnings. Uh, beginning, if we have the next slide, um, um, well, high up there, actually, it's uh, the line of, of Heinrich, Heinrich Heine, where books are burned. In the end, people, too, will be burned. Uh, and then all the way around, if we see some of these other images, please, uh, ending with Mosul, but here, just the next slide, um, a line which actually uh, anatomizes the book burnings of the world. But then you go in. You go in uh, uh, and then the next couple of slides, please. I I've taken the structure and the next slide, please, from a great uh, um, 
uh, uh, Talmud printed in Venice a few hundred yards away, the first great uh, um, amazing printing of, of, of the Talmud. And I've taken that structure, and if we have the next uh, four or five slides, and made vitrines, which are my version of that page of the Talmud, into, if we have, um, um, and it's porcelain, um, it's porcelain, it's always porcelain, but bringing it together with marble and the next few slides, and then, and then, and then, and then, occupying the whole space um, with this library of exile, this, this, this great, extraordinary uh, congregation of, of books written from 80 countries, many dozens of languages. Um, the idea being that from wherever you are in the world, you can come into this space and find a book that resonates with you, which tells the story of migration. Um, because words like clay are migratory. Uh, and we opened this, the next slide, please. Um, and immediately it was filled with people because people could come in. And the next slide, please. Um, there were ex libris plates. So every book you could write your own name in a book that mattered to you. And uh, God help me, I suggested um, that if there was a book that needed to be bought for the library, I would buy it. So you can imagine what that did. It Actually, Tanya, it wasn't 2000 books in the end. It was many, many more, thank God, because people needed to have their own books in that space. So the next slide and the next slide, please. Here is the tiger that came to tea, Judith Kerr's book, in which I think we counted 400 people had written their names, one ex libris plate after another. And then finally, after Venice, this great project where we had dance, amazing writers from around the world, refugee voices, children's groups. Um, um, it was fabulous. All these, it was polyphonic. <laughs> Good word. We moved it to Dresden, to this space, the Japanische Palais, this great, uh, the next three slides, please. This great palace built by uh, Augustus the Strong to house his collections of porcelain destroyed, bombed in February 1945, a shell, but this great, uh, enormous space, this raw space that was Augustus's porcelain palace, but then became a library destroyed in 1945. And here again, if we show the next three slides, this had a different resonance, um, a different kind of feeling in this space. The same books, more books, but they're working with, um, with refugee groups. It is because as you know, Dresden is this cauldron between um, extraordinarily welcome, mostly for Syrian refugees. Uh, and the next slide, and the next slide, but also the center for the far right, in Germany. Uh, this is a list of the destroyed university libraries of the world. But we made for Dresden this incredible space. If we have the next slide, please. So ceramics and social action, yes. This was a working space where people could come and read and write. And the next few slides, please. And in this bombed out space, we had people coming and writing letters uh, and talking and having seminars about language. Uh, and all kinds of things. The next few slides, please. And the opening was extraordinary. And the moment of great, uh, the next slide, please, um, of tenderness, um, a new book written, um, um, Syrian, a beautiful book, a children's book. Next slide, please, in Arabic, um, which was read aloud at the private view by chance because people had come. So what do you do? You move things on. This is surely, surely what ceramics do. They are endlessly migratory. They change their meaning as they move from one hand to another, from one place to another. You know, this is au fond, this is at the heart of, of what ceramic practice might mean, that you might make temporary places along the way, but they are always movable and always susceptible to breakage. They aren't ever unbreakable. 
So the library moves on. Next slide, please. And it goes amazingly to Mosul, to this place. The next slide, please. A great, great, one of the great libraries of, of, of the Middle East. Next slide, which was destroyed by ISIS because holy men always want to see books burn. They always, it doesn't matter where they are. Libraries are, are places of danger uh, for the powerful. And so I worked with Book Aid and other refugee charities. Uh, um, and the next slide, please. And this wonderful image of our library with all these inscriptions from people around the world. The next slide, please. Arriving to have a room in the new um, wonderful Mosul Library, which is still being rebuilt. And that's where that library is. And the structure of the library is being recreated in the Warburg, the Warburg Library, the great um, art historical. <coughs> Sorry, I'm so excited. I'm going to have to drink some water. The Warburg Library, the great library of exile in London. And one of those great vitrines, um, <coughs> excuse me, called Psalm at the end of the year is going to the new National Library of Israel. Breakage, final three minutes, I'm out of time. This image, next slide, please. These, <coughs> excuse me, I've talked myself into a cough. <laughs> next to the library, next to the library, I took and put them in these cases. The next slide, please. These objects, and the next slide, and the next slide. 10 years ago, I bought at auction a series of broken Meissen plates. They were plates that had been owned by the von Klemperer family, a Jewish family in Dresden, great collect collectors. They were looted in 1938 alongside all their collections. And in February 1945, these plates were on a lorry being taken uh, to one of the SS's um, strongholds and they were in Dresden during the firebombing of, of Dresden. And they were destroyed. They were completely destroyed. They were in fragments like this, shards, and they were discovered in the wreckage and the shards were put in a box. And 2010, they were restituted to the family and these shards were bought by me and working with an extraordinary a Japanese artist, Maiko, um, Maiko um, Tatsumi. Um, she has done kintsugi on these plates. And I took them back to Dresden um, and I restituted them briefly for six months to Dresden. And they sat there in this broken uh, fire bond um, um, place, uh, bringing back shards bringing back the possibility of kintsugi, but always saying that kintsugi is not mending. Kintsugi is a way of telling stories about fracture and telling stories about the possibility uh, of change. And that's my stump speech. And I've gone over, and Tanya, I'm sorry, and I'm gonna drink all this water and let you be. Gosh, thank you. I mean, that was that was absolutely fascinating and and uh, incredibly moving. And in the light of the situation we find ourselves, um, especially so um, in an anxious, unhappy Europe. I, I just wanted to ask one sort of question: whether when was the moment when? Um, you saw ceramics. I mean, you, you did marvelous things with ceramics that made me look at modernism afresh, but when was the moment when ceramics came to stand for a, a kind of voice for the voiceless who'd been exiled and lost? Because, you know, that I've just been working on the weaver, Otti Berger, who, you know, she came to England, she was partly deaf, she couldn't communicate. And she ended up in Auschwitz and 
only now is her memory really being disinterred, but, and that's through the little fragments of weavings she left um, that ended up in North America. But when did you have that moment that, um, I think I think the, the 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 thing was that I mean I was always interested, as you know, Tanya, in place, you know, um, and way back, you know, way back in in, in prehistory, I was doing things at Dartington at High Cross House and 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 wanting to wanting to reanimate places and talk to places and talk to sort of um, slightly forgotten bits of bits of history um, of of. Um, and bring bring pots into those conversations, but 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 as you also know from our years of conversations, um, the writing of the Hair with Amber Eyes um, was a very very long time. It was a decade of my life. It was a decade of um, of, of of travel and um, and 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 archives and dust basically, um, and and. On those journeys, that decade, um, most obviously very painfully at the moment to Odessa, um, uh, hugely um, agonizing. Um, um, I, I, I kept thinking, you know, this can be words, but this is also absolutely um, haptic, <laughs> to use the word of the day. This is this is this is something about about how how you re um, how you talk with your hands to places and histories. Uh, and there was a moment, um, um, the, the first time I ever made a vitrine, bizarrely enough, um, was about six months before my book came out. And I, I, I looked at it and I thought, you know what, I've spent years thinking about vitrines, <laughs> years and years, but I never thought of putting pots in them, you know, and there they were. And it was that sort of pausing of pots there. Um, and then that whole progression um, made me think, um, that actually who, 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 who I was, who, who I wanted to be, is that I, I wanted to make things and I wanted to bring them into the world. And that, of course, meant talking to, to those places of, 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 of dissonance for me, um, Paris and Vienna and Odessa and, and on and on and on. And, and, and that's, I suppose, been the last 10 years of my life. Um, um, that's a really rubbish answer, but but but, no. but that's that's what it is. It's fascinating about yes, making your first retreat at that point. That's that's so. I don't know. That's somehow very illuminating. And, um, I love as you know. I love archives. I love you know. I'm I'm happiest. Um, happiest? No, that's not, I'm happiest back there at my wheel always 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 people occasionally say to me you know are you are you happier writing or making and and you know it, it has to be clay <laughs> i mean the writing i mean i i like it you know i'm not i'm not not lying i like it but it has to be there's something profoundly um 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 restorative to me about about simply about about throwing and there is something so powerful about you going into those histories and these quiet objects kind of bear witness you know especially when you make them I don't know look in a way you know I know you can make perfect objects but you 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 can all you you deliberately it seems to me make tender not, not, you know. I, I'll take tender. I'll take tender. I love tender. <laughs> I, I mean, love tender. look, you know, as if they've seen some bad things, you know, and um, survived. If you see what I mean. Well, some don't. I just had an absolutely. This, this is this will cheer everyone up. I had an absolutely rubbish firing last week. So you know, the hammer, the hammer's been out in the studio. So you know, um, you know, it, it's um. And 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 maybe that's that, and that's absolutely part of the sort of the reality of what of what we do. There are some questions here. There's one rather challenging one, which suggests that Bernard Leach would disapprove of this conference. Um, that he believed that that politics had no no role in in 
in what we're all interested in here. But I, I'd sort of disagree with that. But what what do you feel, Edmund? I mean, uh, where does where does Leach, in a way, you kind of um, took Leach apart, kind of politically and ideologically, but. I'd like to think he would be interested in our discussions. Well, Le Le Leach, is, Leach is extraordinary. I mean, he, 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 he remains uh, an un, um, uh, unquantifiable presence in, in, in the world of ceramics, and partly because, of course, he is profoundly connected to the world. He's not a man in retreat. Of course he would love politics. You know, you look, you read his archives in Dartington. There, you know, you 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 read the, the, the archives in the Craft Study Centre, and there's someone who wants to change the world. I mean, wants to change the world through pots. It's you know, the Potter's book is a manifesto for uh, a belief in 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 self reliance in a kind of thorough like way. Um, you know, for 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 the idea that you can you can position yourself and make yourself and the society in which you are engaged a different and better place. You know, his quarrel with Stoke and with industrialism, which runs like a like like a, like an adamantine uh, uh, thread through his life, is is a is a profound and interesting way of him um, positioning himself in the world. You know his training of people, his engagement with the young, um, his internationalism, his Baha'i faith, uh, which is a kind of um, uh, mysterious internationalism, a post-war, which says that actually um, people can come together um, uh, almost beyond politics and find a spiritual path. Um, his decision to go back to Japan after the Second World War and make and, and make um, active peace happen uh, with the, with the Japanese world, when many many people thought that that was a, a, a terrible crossing of a threshold. That after the Japanese war crimes, that you should boycott and not go back to Japan. All of those things, all of those things, indicate an extraordinary man. Who, who, who wants to be in the world, wants to be in the world from his wheel, wants to be in the world from his writing, and wants profoundly from Dartington Conference onwards to change it by having conversations, both with people who are acolytes, and I know I talk about his acolytes quite a lot in, in, in my book, but, but, but also people who disagree with him. And he, he was capable of a good argument. I would hope that Bernard Leach, from wherever he is now, would be thinking, yes, look at the leech pottery, um, amazing, training people, international, celebrating all kinds of discipline, on the front foot when it talks about diversity and inclusion, um, um, all kinds of programs. Um, um, wow, you know, I would, I, um, you know, I, I'm, 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 I'm pro, I'm pro, I'm pro this. <laughs> end of end of rant. Positive, <laughs> positive rant. Here's a, a question from some of Mary Fletcher. Um, what do you feel about Palestine and Israel right now as a kind of site of I'm 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 heartbroken by the ongoing uh, by the ongoing um, pain of 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 the wall of the of palestine of the of the excision of, of rights from palestinians um and you know um though i'm working as you know with the national library of israel um which is very important for me um i'm also deeply involved um as in mosul across the border with working on libraries and working on all kinds of projects what do I think about that? Uh, uh, I'm agonized. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, a, it, it's an ongoing tragedy, yeah. And we're doing a great event here in, in, in June for the Refugee Council. As you may or may not know, um, we sold uh, five years ago uh, for the Refugee Council for unaccompanied refugee children from everywhere, um, part of my Netscape collection. So, you know, we, I'm, I'm very involved in, in active, the active politics of, 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 uh, 
of, of refugees. Here's a question from Isabella Smith. I'd be very interested to hear more about your early career as a leech devotee and perhaps about the performance of throwing. She uses the phrase performative rurality. Um, I love performative rurality. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, I owe so much because, you know, I was, I, I from, honestly, from, from, from 12 onwards, I was in Geoffrey Whiting's studio every day. Um, and 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 uh, making pots and um, very much very very much in that tradition the, the tradition of understanding the everyday object I, I made I made standard wear um behind me we just got them out for a reason um our soup bowls celadon glazed soup bowls that any anyone who worked in the leech pottery in the 40s or 50s would understand because that's what Jeffrey was making too and so I did and 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 uh, um, and then you know what I, I went to Japan when I was very young. I worked in Bizen and Mashiko and um, um, came back and did my apprenticeship. And then post Cambridge, um, building my first kiln in, in, in Hereford and making pots, performative rurality, uh, taking my wheel and making pots in Hereford market. You want performative rurality, that is it. <laughs> um, and of course, selling nothing because Herefordshire then as now was absolutely filled to the gunnels with better potters than me. Um, but it was part of my upbringing. And, you know, I, I moved on, but that's not to say that I am not profoundly moved by that Batterham installation, amazing exhibition in, 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 uh, in, in at, at, at the v and I'm, not profoundly moved by 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 the by the installations at York. Um, I was deeply connected to the Craft Study Centre for ten years, and, and and these things continue to matter because these are histories that that keep unfolding, as we've heard this morning. They keep changing audiences, changing their position in the world. So you know, I, I might have been an angry, an angry person in my twenties. Um, trying to find my own way as a young urban potter. But I look back, you know, with, with, with proper, uh, proper respect to my training. Well, I think, I don't know whether we have time for more questions. It really has been uh, an absolutely wonderful warning and culminating well not culminating because Jarrah's book was marvellous too two fantastic talks and and thank you Edmund so much it's it's lovely to sort of I feel as if I'm quite close taking us back to happy days in Austria when we you know talking trustfully is one of the great joys of any kind of interaction and and thank you so much mm -hmm.